Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, um, Stop TV Partnership, for inviting me here to talk. I'm very privileged to be able to present some of the uh, uses that we've been putting whole genome sequencing to, to help in the diagnosis, treatment and management of uh, people with tuberculosis in the hospital at St George's in Tooting in London. Um, so the main purpose of what we've been doing is to try to use whole genome sequencing in order to rapidly predict antibiotic susceptibility in the treatment of MDR and XDR-TB patients that we have at St George's. Some of these patients can require up to 18 months and sometimes two years of treatment. And during that time, using complex mixtures of antibiotics, things uh, don't always go to plan. And having uh, genetic information that can back up uh, drug susceptibility predictions can actually help the, clinic the clinicians in real time. So if we could develop uh, whole genome sequencing to support treatment of MDR and XDR-TB, some of the things that we would like to be able to deliver is the best evidence-based advice to the clinicians that, base, that, that actually predicts uh, a sensitivity and specificity, sorry, sense, resistance and susceptibility to the antibiotics that are going to be used. We'd also like to be able to link genetic information to uh, quantitative drug susceptibility testing in the, in the terms of MIC, and I'll show you an example of why that's important later and also to be able to predict whether or not a particular SNP or mutation is associated with cross-resistance between the different antibiotics that might be used in the protocols to treat MDR and XDR-TB. Underpinning this whole approach is the need for a, an extremely predictive genotype-phenotype correlation data set. Without that, uh, just looking at the SNPs in individual strains uh, is compromised. Currently, the evidence base for phenotype-genotype correlation is based upon a uh, slightly outdated uh, database called Dream, Dream TV D database, which is available on the internet. Through the literature, which is very extensive, but needs a lot of interrogation and individual interpretation, and also through in-house first and second line susceptibility testings linked to the determination of the SNPs that are present through whole genome sequencing. Just, uh, this slide just tries to show the complexity of what we're trying to deal with and on the left is uh, a lot of the drugs that are used to treat MDR and XDR-TB, the gene targets that are associated with these drugs and therefore where you're looking for uh, mutations associated with resistance. So this slide really shows that you have multiple genes to target, uh, interacting mutations that can compensate or enhance susceptibility and resistance. Uh, that different strains have different distributions of the same SNPs in, the different, in different genes, and so you're going to have variable susceptibility phenotypes. From all the current information, you can categorize essentially confidence calls about the presence of a SNP as to whether it's susceptible or resistant. And at the moment, we can call high confidence calls around isoniazid rifampicin and the quinolone resistance around the target genes, CAT-G and INHA for isoniazid, RPOB, uh, particularly in a particular uh, rifampicin resistance determining region of RPOB that can confer uh, a choice of rifampicin resistance and also in the quinolone resistance determining region in gyre which confers resistance to quinolones and TB. So that's fairly high confidence calls. But if you're starting to look at well, what about some of the other drugs that are used in second line drugs that are used in treatment of MDR and XDR, it starts to get much more complex and the associations between the presence of certain SNPs and certain gene targets uh, in different strains in the presence of other uh, SNPs makes this association much more difficult and we require uh, a lot more information to be able to use these, uh, the presence of these SNPs actually to make a good uh, evidence-based call for susceptibility. The difficulties associated with doing this are uh, whether or not a SNP gives you cross-resistance against different types of antibiotics in the same category, that we don't have any susceptibility uh, test data for any new SNP that we might find through whole genome sequencing, that susceptibility testing actually is fraught with difficulties for second-line drugs, and that often doesn't give you quantitative MIC data that makes it therefore difficult for clinicians to use that sort of information. We also have this that different strains have, uh, are quite variable in the SNPs that they might contain. And you can get secondary mutations and compensatory mutations. So really what I'm trying to say is whole genome sequencing, therefore, is a good way to capture 
all the genetic information, but it needs to be fed into very robust drug susceptibility testing. Um, at St. George's, we've been, uh, over the last year and a half, two years, we've had uh, four extremely uh, drug-resistant tuberculosis cases that have been managed by the clinicians in the hospital. And they kept asking us if we could help them manage these patients by giving them some sequence information that would help them decide which drugs they can and can't use. So we've been taking 12-day uh, time to positivity, positive midget tube cultures and spinning down a couple of mills and extracting the DNA from the TB that's grown and ex exposing, uh, sorry, um, doing whole genome sequencing on, on those bacteria that we've recovered from the positive midget tubes. And we have in the, an in-house iron torrent personal genome sequencing machine, which is essentially a semiconductor machine that can use between 20 and 100 nanograms of DNA and actually give us a very good uh, fold coverage of the entire genome, greater than 35 fold coverage, which allows us to give good statistical robust calls on SNPs. The turnaround time for doing this, once we've got the positive culture, is 24 hours approximately. So we can give the clinicians, once the midget tubes are positive, information about the, the genotype within 24 hours. And the test, this is what we call a high cost, but a high value test, uh, for about 150, 200 pounds. Given that it costs about a thousand pounds for every day for one of these patients to be in an NHS ward. Uh, so we, we're hoping that uh, SNP typing by whole genome sequencing can inform the treatment options for the clinicians. But they're driven by protocols that say they can't treat until they have the results of drug susceptibility testing, which can take weeks to come back from the reference laboratories. So from a clinical perspective, this is often too little and too late. So this is just one example of one of the four patients that we've had here. And it just tries to show you um, the, the, the number of antibiotics that are considered by the clinicians, along with the sort of time during the treatment. And you can see the arrows indicate that where the drug treatment was started, where the reference lab came back with sensitivity results and then was stopped, and then uh, the, the choice, the options that the clinicians have. Uh, this particular um, case, you, um, Various drugs can be continued, so you've got ethambutol, but eventually down here this was shown to be resistant, but ethambutol was coming back. I want to show you a reason why that might be. Um, fluoroquinolones came back as resistant, but actually later on, after we did the whole genome sequencing about here, we could predict a SNP that actually um, allowed the clinicians to have evidence to reuse a, a fluoroquinolone, and I'd like to show you some examples of that. Just in case you're wondering, this patient was on treatment for two years and is now finally being cured and is being culture free for about six to nine months. So what did we do? So we whole genome sequenced it and some of the data we get back, for instance, this is a, a mutation in the gyre gene. This is a, a well-known mutation. We call it A9TV. And uh, the information in the literature suggests that this is associated with an MIC for moxifloxacin of about one to two micrograms per mil. But for some of the other quinolones, the MIC is much higher, up to 6, 8, or 10, or even 16. So the presence of this mutation essentially indicated that if the drug dose of moxifloxacin was increased to 600 milligrams per mil, and based upon the pharmacokinetics of that drug, where you have a peak, in, a peak height of 9.5 uh, and a trough of 1.5 with a long half-life, it meant that you could achieve an MIC for moxifloxacin in the presence of a mutation that would be uh, associated as resistant if you did a, a breakpoint susceptibility test. In. So this piece of information has become the, one of the most crucial pieces of information that the clinicians want to know. What mutation does it have in gyre A? Can we use a, a fluoroquinolone or, or not? Another example is that one of the patients was uh, continued on pyrazinamide because of the unreliability of DST tests. Um, when we did the sequencing, we found that it had a stop codon at one of the positions, which meant that the um, amidase uh, uh, enzyme was clearly not functional, and therefore the clinicians could actually stop using pyrazinamide because of its interactive and toxic, and toxic effects. So that's another example of how identification of a SNP can inform and help treatment. Um, so this is a type of data we might get back from a whole genome sequence analysis of an XDRTB um, sample. And you can see here that we have uh, the gene targets that we've looked at, uh, the drug resistance, uh, the drugs that are associated with resistance, resistance, the position in the genome, and then the mutation. And uh, 
it was nice that a lot of the mutations that we found, firstly, were also confirmed by the Hain test. Some of them matched the Hain test, which has a, a limited number of SNP detections. Uh, but also, a lot of the other mutations that we found uh, also linked. Eventually, we could show that they were matched by the, the susceptibility testing that we do in-house, the second-line drug susceptibility testing. So we're fairly confident that some of these mutations would be associated with, with resistance. So just to show you two examples. We found a mutation in RPOB at um, codon E. coli nomenclature 531, which is serine to lysine, and that gives you very high MICs against all of the rifamycins. So this is cross-resistance to all rifamycins. So if we could detect mutation fairly rapidly after positive midget tube, we could say that rifampicin or any of the rifamycins can't be used. Similarly, this, one of these patients also had this mutation in the gyra gene, that, that says that it has a moxifloxacin MIC of uh, between 1 and 8. So you could use moxi or levo, but not offloxacin. So this type of information is very useful to a clinician when they're trying to balance which drug they can use and whether they can increase the doses. We confirmed a very high level um, mutation, a high competence mutation for CAT-G, which confirms that it's resistant to isoniazid. <coughs> so trying to summarize what uh, this could you deliver is that the early prediction of drug resistance by whole genome sequence can allow a faster and more effective implementation of treatment and therefore improve the patient outcomes uh, using this method. And because we can improve patient outcome, we can reduce the time of infectivity and therefore onward transmission to other, other people. So reduce the time of infectivity, which has a public health impact. And also because you can actually have an evidence for which drugs that you usually use empirically, now you can have evidence for whether you use them, so you can reduce the chance of further resistance occurring because you might be using a combination of drugs, some of which don't have any activity. It's extremely cost effective compared to the price of having a patient in the hospital, and it uh, seems in our experience so far that most of the genotypes that we identify do match the phenotype when tested. So we can conclude then that hopefully, that uh, if we try to implement whole genome sequencing, that can have a direct impact on the selection of treatment. It has a role within the clinical management over that period of 18 months and has a public health impact. But interestingly also, and we've had this now happening at St George's, is that case contacts of MDR and XDRTB cases that come midget positive, uh, you can preempt the drug susceptibility testing by a whole genome sequence analysis, which is quite rapid and easy. So, how near are we to getting to this point of care? Um, to do point of care whole genome sequencing at the moment is uh, a little bit speculative, but there are plenty of uh, companies that are developing technologies where this, uh, within two to three years, possibly five, they might be available. Uh, but I think that we, as a community, we need to prepare for the, uh, when these uh, technologies become available by having this robust phenotype genotype database available so we can make sense of the data that's generated. And it needs to be, these things need to be clinically timely. So a point of care is something you want to work in a few hours, whereas whole genome sequencing currently as we're using it is a few days, but that's much better than waiting for drug susceptibility testing which can take weeks and weeks. Um, so there are two um, things on the market. One, um, this Minion from Oxford Nanopore, this is the Nanopore sequencing, and they're now making uh, a sequencing device the size of a USB stick that will do sequencing in a few hours. And there's this company called Quantum DX in the UK, based in Newcastle, that's trying to develop a handheld point of care <coughs> sequencing device using nanowires and sequencing off, off the back of nanowires, essentially multiplexing PCR sequencing. So I also have to de declare that I am um, co-funded with Quantum DX from the UK government through the Technology Strategy Board to try to develop a, a nanowire-based point-of-care test for TB. Uh, okay. So, am I okay? One minute? One more slide? One minute. Okay. So where are we going next? Um, we need to um, maintain the capacity for doing drug susceptibility testing. Just because we can do whole genome sequencing, we, we have to still require and retain our capacity to deliver susceptibility testing phenotypically so that we can match it. Uh, we need to be able to develop sequencing directly from uh, specimens like sputum, 
rather than relying on a 12 day old midget culture. And we certainly need the access to the database in a format that can be used routinely and clinically. And we need uh, to be able to come to terms with the, the regional and global distributions of strain types. So um, projects that are doing whole genome sequencing on large uh, sets of strains around the world will be very useful uh, for uh, fitting into this um, uh, model of database. So I have my colleague Neil Stoker, who's here today, has set up a proposal for uh, sharing the sort of evidence that comes from SNP detection by sequencing and drug susceptibility testing, uh, whereby information can be put in and taken out and interpretations made. And there's a meeting that's coming up after this, uh, after our symposium here this morning, uh, invited by Tim Walker and colleagues from, from UK, where we're going to discuss how we can maybe build and put together a database that will allow us to do this uh, high confidence genotype phenotype correlation. I'd just like to thank my colleagues at St. George's that have helped with the whole genome sequencing and all the clinicians and the clinical microbiologists that have demanded information from us research people uh, to help them manage their patients. And I'd like to thank you for listening and stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you.